Guess what? We're going to start out with Carl. The present rate of burning Love. of fossil fuels, the present rate of uh, increase of minor infrared absorbing gases in the Earth's atmosphere, that there will be a several centigrade degree temperature increase uh, on the Earth, global average, uh, by the middle uh, to the end of the next century, and that has a variety of consequences, including uh, uh, redistribution of local climates and uh, through the uh, uh, melting of uh, glaciers, uh, an increase in global sea level. There is concern uh, on a somewhat longer time scale about the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and uh, a general rise of uh, many, many meters in, uh, in sea level. So uh, we, uh, we have a kind of handwriting on the wall. Uh, certainly there's more research to be done, but as I say, there is a consensus. What can be done about it? The idea that we should uh, immediately stop burning fossil fuel has uh, such severe economic consequences that no one, of course, will take it seriously. But there are many other things that can be done. Uh, one has to do with uh, subsidies for fossil fuels. More efficient use Still. could be uh, encouraged by fewer government subsidies. Secondly, there are alternative energy sources, uh, some of which are uh, useful, uh, at least locally. Um, solar power is certainly one that might be of more general use. Such a visionary, billions and billions. Do you remember the billions, Sandy? Yes. yes. <laughs> he was, a, a, he's an amazing he's guy. Awesome. I do. Awesome. I do, sweetie. All right. So we're going to go from Carl. And really quickly, I wanted to talk about the Antarctic Treaty System because basically uh, the Antarctic Treaty and related agreements collectively known as the Antarctic Treaty System ATS regulate international relations with respect to Antarctica, Earth's only continent without a native human population. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was the first arms control agreement established during Cold, the Cold War, setting aside the continent as a scientific preserve establishing freedom of scientific investigation and banning military activity for the purposes of the treaty system. Antarctica is defined as all the land and ice shelves south of the 60 uh, south de degree south latitude. Since September 2014, I mean 2004, the Antarctic Treaty Secretariat, which implements the treaty system, is headquartered in Buenos Aires. The main treaty was open for signature, on December 1st, 1959, very good year, officially mm -hmm. entered into force on the 23rd of June, 61. The original signatories were the 12 countries active in Antarctica during the International Geophysical Year of 57-58, which were Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, the Soviet Union, um, at the time, United Kingdom and the United States. These countries had established over 55 Antarctic research stations and uh, the subsequent, subsequent promulgation of the treaty was seen as diplomatic expression of operational and scientific cooperation that had been achieved. So as of 2021, the treaty has 56 parties. So I thought uh, we would start with explaining this to you, that it is not, not there, it's, there's no native humans, and it is supposed to be a scientific preserve. And given that, I always like to put a little plug in for my friend, Max Delapia, who um, has this glacier right over here named after him. A glacier that descends the east slope of Craddock Massive and flows between Mount Mole and Effering Peak into the Thomas Glacier and the Sentinel Range in the Ellsworth Mountains in Antarctica. And they, it was named by the Advisory Committee on Antarctic Names in 2006 after my buddy Colonel Max Delapia, commander of the 109th Air Wing, Airlift Wing, New York, yes, my state, National Guard, and... Um, 
Actually, he ran for Congress here, and he would have been a phenomenal. He was. He's just such a great progressive. But yeah, of course, yeah. the Republican asshole won, and that's the guys who saw. I had his sign out in front of my house, and uh-huh. that's and I'm my, that's why my mailbox got knocked down. I remember that. Yeah. Oh my Be- god. And he would have so been funny. the best congressman. Instead, we have Nick Langworthy, the useless Trump sycophant. Okay, I'll move on. But anyway, Max, I know you're not watching, but you're a great guy. And so it's very interesting about this advisory committee. I did a little more reading on it, but didn't want to bore you guys all night. So we move on. This is Antarctica. And this was the median, the Weddell. See all the different, the, the uh, Amundsen, the Ross. Why can't I see the dark? So the main thing, <laughs> yeah. the main thing to point out here is the difference between the yellow line and the fuzzy white cloudy stuff, which is the Antarctic sea ice. And in 2023, it was really cutting in. And if you can see the, the yellow line up by the Weddell Sea, see how much it's changed there? Mm-hmm. It's really changed in a lot of different places. So the Antarctic sea ice is on the decline. And um, we're going to investigate that and look at why that could be and yep. what's gone on with it. Yep. Okay. We also have an intermission video. I forgot. Oh, okay. This is what it looks like by the different station names. South Georgia, Orcatus, um, Rothra, Bird, McMurdo, which everybody's heard of McMurdo. I think that's a very famous one. Vostok, Mawson goes by the climate zone, the altitude, um, and then the, the temperatures. So I just thought that was a, a good visual for you guys to see. What is um, what is Antarctic made up of? You know, what is Antarctica made up of? All right. But now we're going to move on. And Jennifer, take it away. So you guys, you might remember a couple of weeks back, we showed this. And this is a temperature anomaly map at basically six feet above whatever is, you know, the surface, right? Mm -hmm. And right away, you know, we talked about the Andes, which are red hot. But what I really want to start a dive into, guys, is this blue blob stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. these are anomalously cold petals. Where could these petals be coming from? You know, like if the sea is anomalously hot and it's fresh water on the sea, right? So fresh water is much lighter. Even if it's cold, it's not dense because it's not salty and it floats. Where could it come from? Well, probably comes from, you can see some coming out of Patagonia right there. That's the melt in, you know, South America, but also Antarctica. And you can see in particular on the lower left, that big puddle there, that is basically creating anomalously cold air and water and so because you know as the it the um wind sweeps across it's going to pick up that temperature from the surface of the water if it's anomalously cold so that's just kind of leading into one of our topics tonight called the cold tongue <laughs> what is <the> cold tongue <laughs> yeah would you like me to move on yes please ma'am all right And this is a little bit of a picture of what that cold tongue could be. So if you all check out that basically anomalously cold yellow streak going across on the equatorial region, that is making up the cold tongue. And it's very interesting. And it's been... um, The reason I kind of clued into this is I was watching the morning news and they are covering climate change a little bit more now, thank goodness. And they started talking about the cold tongue and they're like, you know, for the last 30 years, this equatorial cold tongue in the Pacific has been building up and it's not going away. And we'd expect if the seas are warming that the cold tongue would be warming too, but it's not. And then they said, Maybe this is a sign of hope. Oh, oh. I, 
I'm afraid oh. not. I don't think the cold time. They're like, oh, well, maybe it's working. What? <sighs> what? Uh, this is denial, you know, runs thick. So <laughs> what the hell, you know? Yeah. What the hell? Not a laughing matter, really. <laughs> yeah. So this is a very interesting one. This is the ice shelves and floating ice tongues that surround Antarctica cover more than 1.5 million square kilometers, approximately the size of the entire Greenland ice sheet. Conventional wisdom has held that ice shelves around Antarctica lose mass mostly by iceberg decaffing. But recently, it has become increasingly clear that melting by a warming ocean may also be important. And this is Reno. I think his first name is Eric. He's very famous. Eric I watched, Reno, yeah, yeah, Eric. He, he's, he is. He, yes, he's. He Glaciologist. Does all of it. Yep. You, Jen, mm -hmm. you want to talk about the actual graph? Oh, well, it's so interesting, right? These are actual temperatures here. This is not an anomaly, but, you know, clearly the deep purple there right beside the Antarctic ice shelves or ice, I guess you would say sea ice, right? In that case, yeah, sea ice, you know, and if you kind of go up the west coast of South America, you can sort of see, but it's doing this along all the continents, but the the cooler air tends to kind of waft up the continent. And then I don't know. I mean, it's very interesting. Look at that yellow kind of cooler area right across the equator. Could that be part of the cold tongue? I am not sure. I think I just like saying cold tongue. Is what the <laughs> She's a cold tongued bitch. I just like saying cold tongue. That's good. I'm going to have to write a song. <laughs> the cold tongue. <laughs> The girl with the cold tongue. Oh, yeah. Man. All right. That's great. So it, it was an interesting one, but now we have a little entertainment. A tipping point is something that happens to the climate system that's irreversible on human time frames can't get back to the old climate state, not for potentially millennia. The one that matters for Antarctica is essentially the point at which the ice shelves are all gone. And that will cause very rapid sea level rise above the levels of the current projections. So the Antarctic ice sheet itself sits on continental bedrock. But the ice essentially flows from a high point to a low point, then it hits the ocean, and so it flows onto the ocean, it floats on the ocean, and we call that the ice shelf. The Ross Ice Shelf is a spectacular example. It's the biggest ice shelf in the world, size of France, size of Texas. But there are ice shelves all around the coast of Antarctica, and what these ice shelves do is they hold back the ice flowing off the continent, yeah. and they slow down the dynamic flow of ice under gravity into the ocean. Unfortunately, these ice shelves are all melting, they're all thinning because the ocean is warming, and in some places around West Antarctica, it's warming a lot. Mm. The last an ice shelf, for example, the, the size of England, and it, it, it essentially disintegrated in a couple of months. Then what happened? The glaciers feeding the last an ice shelf sped up 10 times. So we're seeing that happen all around Antarctica. And what we think is that there will be a threshold whereby the ocean warms and all those ice shelves are, are going to pretty much go at once and they're going to go very, very fast. And once they go, then there's nothing to stop the rest of the ice sheet just sliding into the ocean. Now there's another wrinkle here, another instability. So West Antarctica essentially sits in a big bowl below sea level. Large parts of it are two kilometers below sea level. So that warm ocean nibbles away at the edges and gets into the soft underbelly. You can imagine you've got this ice sheet flowing into the ocean, but as it retreats into the bowl, the edges of the ice sheet start to lose the grip on the side of the bowl. It's, it's clinging on to the edges, but it's about to slip off. There's nothing for them to hold on to anymore. And so what happens is you, it's like a bunch of dominoes falling over. These ice cliffs just topple. 
And we've seen that in Jakobshavn Glacier up in Greenland. You know, it's an incredible thing to watch. These immense ice cliffs, 30 kilometers long, just boom. And if that really plays out at large scale around Antarctica, we're grossly underestimating the amount of sea level rise from Antarctica. Ultimately, the key thing is carbon dioxide warming the climate. The natural climate cycles, which have regulated the ice ages, occur exactly in step with the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In other words, it is the pacemaker of Earth's climate. And CO2, the greenhouse gases, and Earth's temperature are totally locked. We know from ice core records and geologic records that you have to go back three million years to see a time when our planet last had 400 parts per million carbon dioxide on the atmosphere. Here we have the Andrew drill system sitting here on the Ross Ice Shelf. We made a whole 84 metres... So one of the areas of research I've spent much of my life doing is drilling sediment cores from around the Antarctic margin. We drilled back to sediments that were three million years old to answer that question when CO2 is at 400 parts per million or higher. What happened to Antarctica? What happened to the sea ice? What happened to the ice sheet? How warm did it get? To give us information about the world we're heading into. And we were able to reconstruct what was living in the Ross Sea. And it was algae. And we know that this algae lives north of the polar front these days in the sub-Antarctics. So we know that the Ross Sea was five degrees warmer than present, no sea ice, and we know that the Ross Ice Shelf had collapsed. There is no West Antarctic ice sheet. And not only that, we know from other drilling projects that big parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet also disappeared. Global sea level records from around the world tell us that sea level was about 20 metres higher. So the Paris target says we must limit global warming to less than two degrees. And this is one of the reasons. It's a tipping point for the Antarctic ice sheet. Even if we achieve the Paris target, we'll get 50 centimetres of sea level rise in a century. That's baked in from the heat that's already in the system. People underestimate what 50 centimetres really means for us globally. 800 million people around the world are going to be affected by high tide flooding. It's the rising sea level, but it's also the storms that are on top of that rising sea level. And so, you know, Hurricane Sandy that wiped out big parts of Manhattan. Water is splashing over the sea walls at the tip of lower Manhattan. Those sort of coastal flooding events will be an annual occurrence. And we can't avoid that, that's locked in. So we've got to adapt to living in a warmer world. So, here we go. Take it away, Jen. Well, you know, we've been talking about the loss of sea ice in both Antarctica and in the Arctic, but also, of course, as we know, the land ice is going away in Greenland, which is right next to the Arctic, and in Antarctica. And Greenland, if you just take a look, they're pretty much on the same scale. So the steepness is real. It's comparable between these two graphs. Greenland is losing ice at this point much, much faster. Antarctica has more recently kind of gotten into the game and you can see it's steadily losing ice from its ice sheet, in particular in West Antarctica, but East Antarctica is picking up as well. So it is kind of happening right now on a planet near wow. you and we are losing ice like there ain't no tomorrow right now right right, right yeah. now and we've got another one from Ooh. durham university We aim to please and educate. What we did in this research is we looked at the eastern part of Antarctica, which is known as the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. And the reason we looked at East Antarctica 
is that it's by far the world's largest ice sheet. It's this giant of ice that covers most of Antarctica. It's so big that it's about four kilometers thick in places and it stores about 52 meters of sea level rise. So if it all disappeared overnight, sea level would be 52 meters higher in the morning, which is quite alarming. That's not going to happen. But what we were interested in is how stable is the East Antarctic ice sheet? Because for a long time, scientists have thought that compared to West Antarctica, compared to Greenland, this ice sheet is more stable. It's less vulnerable. Perhaps we don't need to worry so much about it in a warming climate. But in this research, we looked at times in the past when climate was just a little bit warmer than present. And we looked at the response of the East Antarctic ice sheet and we found that it retreated. And in some cases, it retreated quite dramatically perhaps contributing somewhere between five and 10 meters to sea level. So there's lessons from the past that tell us that East Antarctica might not be as stable as scientists think. We also looked at satellite observations of where the ice sheet has changed over the last few decades. And again, there were some quite alarming signs because whilst most of the ice sheet seems to be quite stable, there are some parts that appear to be thinning and retreating and contributing to sea level rise, just like West Antarctica and Greenland are. And although it's only a part of East Antarctica, because the ice sheet's so big, it's a part we need to worry about because some of these catchments contain maybe three or four meters of sea level rise just within them. And perhaps the most important part of this research is that we looked at computer model simulations of the ice sheet over the next few centuries. And that was both encouraging, but also quite alarming. Because what it showed was that the future evolution or the stability of the East Antarctic ice sheet is really sensitive to the emission scenario. Mm. So what we found is that under low emission scenarios, particularly scenarios that would see us meet the Paris climate target of about two degrees or ideally 1.5 degrees, above pre-industrial values. If we, can, if we can kind of keep our emissions to that temperature target, it looks like the East Antarctic ice sheet will remain intact and will be quite stable over the next few centuries. Mm. Perhaps more alarmingly though, was that when we ran the computer models and we looked at the sea level contribution from East Antarctica under a higher emission scenario, under emission scenarios that exceed the Paris Climate Agreement, we start to see several meters of sea level rise. In fact, we could see up to five meters of sea level rise by 2500. So what this tells us is that there's an ice sheet there that at the moment is relatively stable, that it will stay stable if we stick to the Paris Climate Agreement, but if, the, if we exceed that target, we could see some quite alarming contributions to sea level. And that would be in addition to the contributions that will be made by Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheet. So one of the key conclusions from this research is that we still have this very narrow window to try and meet the Paris Climate Agreement and to protect the world's largest ice sheet. And so in that sense, the fate of the world's largest ice sheet is still in our hands. Wow, very powerful. Yeah. So this is interesting, just to point out, it's a global phenomenon. So what we're looking at here, of course, is the very famous North Atlantic sea surface anomaly graph. Year by year, we're, you know, two thirds of the way through 2023. And you are here, you are here. If you take the T and you go straight up above the T, that is us. There is no place to put this on the graph. So, so the point is, is that this is anomalous and immediate and it is happening right now in particular. And it's been on its way for some time, but now there's sort of, I see this, and I will say tipping point all throughout the world in various places. So this is what's happening in the North Atlantic. Updated. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, the Antarctic sea ice anomaly this year from January 1st to 2023. It's very hard to see what it's anomalous to because it's a single line and no colors. So I'm not purpose. really sure how to interpret this I because think it's did a single it on line. purpose just to show you the standard deviation and and below the um see it was okay. for it was for dramatic effect on oh. x <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, Elliot does a lot of different kinds, but um, all right, now here we go again to some conversation. We're here to talk about the missing Antarctic ice that's made um, quite a lot of news recently. Lots of scientists. Can you tell us what has happened? Why is this big news? Yeah, so we are talking about sea ice here. So that's ice that forms in the ocean each year and every year in February and it's it's got its lowest area and then it freezes through the winter until September. And what's really caught our attention right now is that this winter as that freeze up happens, um, it's much slower than normal. And by one measure, kind of the amount of sea ice that's been missing is at the moment greater than Mexico. So that's how much less ice we've got than what we should normally have at this time of year. Now, my immediate sort of suspicions are obviously around global warming, um, but that might not be the whole picture as far as I understand. Exactly. And it's that whole picture that that's the important thing. So we do expect um, as the climate warms that there's more heat in the, the climate system, but particularly there's more heat in the ocean. And that would cause um, sea ice to freeze up less readily. And we can see that there is more heat in the ocean around Antarctica now than there has been previously. But as you say, some of the complexities about that are that um, how that ocean heat has been distributed might be partly to do with natural cycles, um, but it's unlikely to pull the full story, but it's just very hard to have all the evidence on that. And in addition, we do know that particularly in terms of some of the local changes that have happened. So for example, west of the Antarctic Peninsula, some of those local changes could be more tied to wind patterns. Um, but the just the extent of the anomalies at the moment are kind of causing quite a lot of climate science scientists to say this looks as if it could be the start of a signal linked to climate change. And would you say this is concerning at this stage? What does this potentially signify? I think say? it is concerning. Um, one reason it's concerning for me is just that we don't really understand what's going on. And obviously that's always alarming because that means challenges our ability to make predictions um, of the sea ice itself, which is important to understand for things like ecosystems. Um, but also it's concerning because sea ice does affect us globally. Um, and so there are a number of ways in which it does that. Uh, one is that it affects how much heat the um, ocean takes up. So sea ice is a reflective layer on the surface of the ocean if you take that away you've got a darker surface that absorbs more of the sun's heat and therefore you're going to heat up the ocean more and the atmosphere more and we've seen that effect already in the arctic Another way that sea ice is important for us globally is that the pattern of um, sea ice and its formation and melt um, affects ocean, the ocean underneath it. So it affects how the ocean takes up heat and mixes heat down. And that's really important for global ocean circulation. And we can see that that's already um, changing. And so as sea ice changes more, um, we could see kind of global effects on ocean circulation. And just finally, then, what will scientists potentially be looking to investigate now to, to get more information about what is happening? So one of the real ones is observations in the ocean, I think. So um, we, it's very hard to observe around Antarctica, obviously. So um, we just want to find ways of, of pursuing getting more observations in the ocean. Um, there's a big um, symposium happening soon called the Southern Ocean Observing S um, Symposium, System Symposium. And so they'll be discussing, I think, um, the sea ice part of that will be discussing um, observations. Um, another is that we still don't understand how thick the sea ice is so we we can see how much area it covers but we don't know how thick it is and it's an ongoing question to improve how we use information from satellites to understand that um, and a final one is is understanding further what climate models tell us about sea ice in antarctica all right so we're bringing you the voices tonight of different climate yeah. scientists that you guys may not be familiar with yeah, and I kind of want to just call before we move on, and yep. we can take a look at that, that that graph that they were showing, the multi-year graph with all of the different colors, yeah. you know. I can't year fast year. forward here. There, there we go. I, I'm like disoriented with <laughs> the I wish I could. Yeah. <laughs> right is left, left is right. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but I, I'm sure everybody here remembers it. And it's different colors, right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that's very interesting. And this is, this is like classic misunderstanding. So the actual height 
of the Antarctic sea ice. For some years it went up. Why would that be, right? Think about that. The height of the Antarctic sea ice was what? 2014. Mm -hmm. 2014, yeah. the Antarctic sea ice was as big as we had ever measured it. And of course, the misunderstanding was like, oh, well, guys, there is no global warming. Look at Antarctica, the Antarctic sea ice is bigger than it's ever been. But of course, it was two interlaced tipping points. And one of them was on land. We were, di the yeah. Antarctica was melting more ice, more water into, you know, fresh, fresh, light water. Right. It spreads out like a little pancake, right? And that was happening. But the ocean heat hadn't yet caught up. So it was like, it was like not so warm as it is now. And so the all that ice that or uh, melted water rather, you know, very cold, re refroze very easily because it was right on the edge, you know, and now there's a lot more ocean heat and that's not happening. And all of a sudden that was like a false positive, right? See, yeah. and the Antarctic sea ice is like melting a lot more that's because an interesting way to we're, put it. yeah. Well, because the ocean heat content's caught up and it's pressing in on it and it's gone past the critical point. So it can't melt because it's it's above 32 degrees. I mean, it can't form. So there you go. Kind of interesting. Yeah, I just I thank you for explaining it. It was good. And this is they are finding, you know, working to find out how long this is a, a project types. It's a Horizon Europe. And basically, this is just a little thing. West Antarctic's ice sheet rests partly on frozen seabed. The amount of ice equals five meters of sea level rise. Warmer ocean temperatures undermine the ice shelves. This leads to an accelerating loss of ice after passing not yet identified tipping points. West Antarctica loses most of its ice, resulting in practically irreversible sea level rise. So when that was this research when you know the other guy the other scientist had said okay 2500 i mean you know that's so abstract it, it's it, it it's when you use numbers like that it makes everybody complacent but mm -hmm. you know yeah. he's got models i'm not going to argue with his science but i'm not a antarctic polar climate scientist all right This is sweet. I can't. So cute. They're beautiful. Aren't they? Oh my no. god. Oh my so, gosh. Oh, so gorgeous. They really are. Why don't we just oh, look at that again? Yeah. Oh, I just want to pick it up and hug it. I love it. And I watch videos, Jen, with hundreds of penguins. I just couldn't show every single video. All right, we have one more to listen to right here, and then we're going to move on. Um, and, and that's the kind of emotion that I had when I... Um, saw that study that, that came out a couple of months ago looking at those, um, the projections of the slowdown of Antarctic bottom water. Um, it was one of those things that scientifically we knew was possible, but actually sort of seeing this, the magnitude and the rate at which that might be happening, uh, that's the emotion associated with that is one of, um, I guess, shock as a, as a scientist that... Um, Yes, we knew it was bad, but it's even worse than we thought. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. she is a paleo a paleoclimate scientist with research expertise covering natural climate variability and human-caused climate change impacts from the tropical oceans to Antarctica, a wide berth she covers. And mm -hmm. um, her name is Nurley Abram. So mm -hmm. we've brought you, and we have one more in the intermission video, good one, um, We've brought you some different voices, but I got to tell you guys, we're saved. We got Barbie. We've got Barbie. We've got the Barbie. eco leadership team. That is awesome. Look at that.
Yeah, let me see if I can find our... Uh, we got Barbie meows and Barbie. We've got Barbie and 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 we will be okay. <laughs> it is and and this is the Jane Goodall Institute Barbie and it's the Eco Leadership Team. Four dolls made from recycled plastic. Well, I suppose I'd rather have kids playing with this than, you know, horrible ugly things. At least this gives a, you know, a a powerful message to kids that you can be on the eco leadership te team, you know, without, I mean, scaring a six year old and telling her you're fucked. No, we you yeah. don't do that. So do it, it was kind of cute. Pleasure. But we're safe. He's in Antarctica and is one of the world's um, fastest changing glaciers. We can talk a bit more about why it's important, but Many scientists around the world recognized that it um, was changing and we needed to understand it better. So the United States and the United Kingdom are partners in a joint project. It's the largest joint project between the countries for Antarctic science ever. We're spending about $50 million to study how weights is behaving. We're working there both on land and at sea and in computer modeling um, over a period of five years. Um, and we are approaching the end of that time period now. Thwaites Glacier has the potential to contribute about 65 centimeters to global sea level rise. Um, so yes, about two feet. And that's not going to happen instantly but it does have the potential to happen rapidly, at least rapidly on the geologic time scale. Already, Waits Glacier currently contributes about 4% per year to annual sea level rise. So that's a lot for a single glacier, but it's not alarming. The reason there's so much interest in Waits Glacier, warm water is reaching the base. Antarctic glaciers, are resting in contact with the ocean. So they're very different than what you might imagine in the Himalayas or the Alps, where ice is up in the mountain. Ice in the Antarctic is in contact with the water. And of course, water is liquid. That means it's above freezing. The ice is solid, it's below freezing. And so that thermal difference right there is what controls the retreat of the ice. Warm water has been found to be impinging or reaching up to the base of the ice. Overall, Antarctic air is very cold. It's very cold in the air. We're not melting ice from the top. It stays frozen. It doesn't rain, it just snows. But if we warm the water underneath the ice, just a tiniest bit, then we're changing that thermal balance and melting the ice from the bottom and destabilizing the ice from that side. 65 centimeters might not sound like a lot, but that's a glacier the size of Florida. And so what that means is that's going to spread out around the planet. Thwaites has the potential to be um, very catastrophic. So all of West Antarctica, which includes Thwaites, is marine based ice. And what that means is that once retreat will start, it will get worse. So some places um, where something changes, it will change a little bit and then stabilize. The retreat of West Antarctic or marine based glaciers um, will be uh, positive feedbacks. Once it starts going a little, it will go more and then it will go more. And Thwaites Glacier is a prime example where as we start to step back, Thwaites will be in deeper and deeper water, making it harder and harder for it to get to its footing. It's like a skier going downhill, and if they start to lose their balance, they're not going to find a place to rest until they get to the very bottom of the hill. Weights is like that. Once it starts to lose its footing, it will just get worse and worse. And so some people study the ice from the top. 
Some people study it from satellites. What we do is we work in the ocean, right at the margin of the ice to understand that interface between the two. You mentioned earlier that the water has been found to be warming right next to the ice. And what that means is we've actually measured water temperatures and our colleagues and our teams have found that warming signal. My students and I take sediment cores, just like geologists in the oil industry or any other type of geologist. We don't work on ice, we work on sediments. And we take those sediments to find out, was that warm water there in the past? And we are able to look at um, the chemistry and the microfossils in those sediments and get a hint of when was the warm water there in the past. And one thing that we can say is, at least on a short time scale, this is new. The warm water has just started to impinge in this area in recent decades. Important for conveying to the public what we know about the climate and the potential change. I and all of the colleagues I have, every scientist I know, has exceptionally high confidence in the fact that the ice is retreating, the retreat is accelerating as we watch it, and that there is a expectation that that retreat will continue. So that's high confidence. Accelerating retreat will continue only medium confidence in how much it will accelerate. We don't know if it's gonna go from contributing 4% to 5% or 6% or 10% or 20 or 50, but we know it's not going to two or one. We know exceptionally well, high confidence, retreat of the ice sheet is accelerating. What we can't say is how rapidly yet. It's in the UK and you know, a hundred of us are spending our um, you know, holidays there year after year because we are trying to achieve that confidence. Um, it's a lot easier, of course, to have high confidence in what we can see today than in predictions. But if we, the type of scientists that work in the field, gather enough data, we can help improve the models of the future behavior. Because those future, the bit, models of future behavior are calibrated, they're defined by using the facts we observe about the past. We use the past as a way to calibrate our understanding of the future. So the more we know, um, the more we can get confident. Yes, that's absolutely our scientific purpose out there. Now you've listened to my story. Here's the point that I have made. Chicks were born to give you fever, be it Fahrenheit or centigrade, to give you fever. When you kiss them fever, if you live, you learn. Fever! Till you sizzle, oh, what a lovely way to burn, oh, what a lovely way to burn, what a lovely way to burn, oh,